Welcome to Gay USA. I'm Andy Hobb. And I'm Ann Northrup, putting on my glasses because when I'm at home, I can't see as well as in the studio. I'm just glad you're not in jail. More about that later. (laughs) In the news this week, LGBT activism uh, helped get the anti-LGBT Franklin Graham to leave town in New York, where he was on the verge of expanding uh, his Samaritan's Purse operation. And we at Reclaim Pride held a press conference on Sunday to hold the governor, the mayor, and Mount Sinai Hospital, excuse me, hospital, accountable for collaborating with Graham and his bigotry. But the NYPD, our friends, the police department, showed up and busted it up. Well, they only issued they only issued one summons. <laughs> <laughs> More about that. We're right? laughing, but this has been a busy week and a productive week. Yeah. Uh, it, now, it is very tough to get data on how COVID-19 is affecting LGBT people and people with HIV, despite mandates in many places to collect such data. And I'm afraid this week we have another list of people we've lost uh, to the virus and otherwise, including Uh, Gay historian David Carter, WNYC radio anchor Richard Hake, Florida activist Terry Fleming, and a pioneering psychoanalyst. Andy had a baby this week. (laughs) You get to guess which Andy. Uh, The ex-pope, Benedict, uh, who we thought was, uh, you know, locked in a closet somewhere, literally, says same-sex marriage was brought by the Antichrist. Uh, At least three of the Pulitzer Prize winners are gay. And we'll introduce you to them. And we have a couple of movie recommendations from our uh, sometimes co-host, Chris Cooper. And we want to wish a belated happy birthday to our director, Rich. Oh, yes, Rich. His birthday on Monday. Happy birthday, Rich. And thank you for doing this with us every week (laughs) and every year. (laughs) Every decade at this point. And we're going to have another 50th anniversary to celebrate on this show. Okay. Uh, So we start with the news. Yes. Well, we are, you know, we've talked about this a lot, but we're going to spend a little time on this at the top of this show. And that is Reclaim Pride versus Franklin Graham and his Samaritan's Purse and versus New York City and New York State and Mount Sinai Hospital. As you know, because we've talked about it a lot here, uh, we are horrified that the bigot Franklin Graham, who hates LGBTQ people and calls us, uh, you know, uh, child molesters and uh, abominations, abominations, detestable. We're going to everlasting hell and says basically the same thing about Muslims and abortion and uh, everyone he who isn't him. So Trump supporter, too. Oh, very close to Trump, in spite of all his moralizing. And he was welcomed to New York City with his uh, Samaritan's Purse medical tents by the governor, by the mayor, and by Mount Sinai Hospital. And with all that's going on in this city, all over this city, where did he set up those tents? In lovely Central Park across the street from Mount Sinai. They could advertise their wares to the world. Everything had Samaritan's Purse on it. Now, I want to say something, because people misunderstand this. We would have no objections to fundamentalist Christians, individuals, nurses, doctors who wanted to come to Mount Sinai, volunteer under their staff, not proselytize like these people did and not raise money for themselves, but just do the work. We we don't object to people. We don't have a statement of faith that people have to sign. Right. Which Which, the statement of faith is you have to agree with everything that their uh, God, uh, you know, says, including that marriage is only between a man and a woman and a whole bunch of other things. And you can't do it. So there were two gay guys who tried to join them and they were not allowed to and they have discrimination complaints. And that's the thing, we're supposed to accept them, but they don't accept us. Correct. And there's a lot of talk about signing this statement of faith as being, you know, the nut of the problem. But to me, the whole problem is who the, who Franklin Graham is and what his whole worldview is. And the idea that we would welcome that into New York City in any guise. This is a guy who has been disinvited from the national prayer breakfast of all things. 
has been disinvited from giving speeches all over the United Kingdom this summer before the virus hit. Uh, he is a terrible, terrible guy. So the idea that we would want to pal up with him and welcome him to the city while he's exploiting the patients by bringing cameras into the uh, tents and then turning that into fundraising ads that he's running on CNN is just an so, abomination. So the development this week was, okay, we thought they were f finally winding down after all the hospital ships set sail this past week and we didn't need them anymore. Hospital, uh, we're, we're, we're grateful that hospitalization is going down in this town and less help is needed. So we thought they were going to leave. No, Mount Sinai has a downtown empty hospital, the old Beth Israel, and they were going to move Samaritan's Purse in there to provide uh, free labor and, uh, and that, so that they wouldn't have to do stuff. So then Reclaim Pride planned a press conference for this past Sunday. And in anticipation of that, I called various public officials, including Brad Hoylman, that's his district. I called the council, he's a state senator, and the, and the council member, Carlina Rivera, she's the head of the hospitals committee and Speaker Corey Johnson. And they all said, no, this is enough enough. We don't need them anymore. Why are we continuing to give them a platform now indoors? So stop it. And finally, at the last minute, the hospital issues a statement. We love Samaritan's Purse, but they're packing up and leaving. From the Central Park and from Beth Israel Hospital. Now, we, we knew about the Beth Israel deal because uh, a Mount Sinai employee had leaked a memo to us at Reclaim Pride from the president of the Beth Israel Hospital saying, we are happy to welcome Samaritan's Perth to Beth Israel. We're reopening floors. So we decided we would hold a press conference to reveal this to the world. But we also decided that we would put those details in the press release in hopes that it would get out and be leaked and that you and others would call people to account. And sure enough, the day before the press conference, Mount Sinai put out the press release saying Samaritan's Purse was folding its tents and leaving town. And they, so, you know, they, they would never condemn the bigotry of Franklin yeah. Graham. You know the phrase they used? We have a difference of opinion. A difference of opinion? That's outrageous. And somebody from the hospital said to me, oh, you'd rather die than take their help? I said, that is an absolute false choice. How dare you, you know, say that? We would accept help from anybody, but but people can't just bring their bigotry in here. So we hold the, we decide to go ahead with the press conference, even though the news is leaking out, because we want to say that we want to hold the governor, the mayor and Mount Sinai accountable for bringing these people in. And we still want answers about how this happened. So we line up speakers, a lot of clergy members to talk about uh, Franklin Graham's uh, uh, religious bigotry. Uh, and various uh, major players. And we decide how we're going to do it. Just a few people there, uh, maintaining physical distance, wearing masks, all very calm and cool. We get over to Beth Israel where we're doing this. And I, I'm the designated police liaison. That's my role in a lot of these things because I... The lesbian help. liaison. I can communicate with both sides and help them talk to each other. So I arrive and, and the cops have seen me before at these things. I get there and they're going, hi, Ann. Good to see you. We're so happy to be working with you guys again because you're easy. You're orderly. You're under control. You're adults. You know what you're doing. Welcome. We're happy to have you here. So I go over to the group. And meanwhile, I see one of the leaders of the cops on the phone and he's on the phone for like 15 minutes. And I think to myself, I wonder who he's talking to and what that's all about. Well, he gets off the phone and suddenly the cops are multiplying in number geometrically and coming over to us and saying, you have to disperse immediately. You have to get out of here. This is an illegal organized gathering. Well, let's show some pictures here so people understand what we're talking about. Let's show the picture of the of the action. Look, people are spaced apart. They're not congregating. They're not carrying AK-47s. <laughs> no, they're wide apart. They're against the fence, so they're not blocking the sidewalk. It's all, it was pre planned like that. It was under control. We got there. We set ourselves up like that. And then and the cops make their big announcement. You got a picture of that? Maybe. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Uh, you must disperse immediately. You will face summons or arrest. You you are an illegal gathering per the governor and the mayor. You must leave. And we say I'm over there. I'm, I'm over there on the uh, on the right. Uh, they yes. were going to arrest reporters. Yes. And look, I'm far away from everybody. They, they threatened were to the arrest press. us, too. So we start talking among ourselves and to them and saying, you know, what are you talking about? You just welcomed us here. What happened? And, and uh, OK, you know, we'll put some of these people over on an opposite corner and and others on another corner. And they say to us, no, that's still an organized gathering. You must get out of here. And this, so we yeah, this are is, this well, is total outrage because yeah. the First Amendment says you can, you know, if you're if you're following the rules, you should be able to express yourself under the First Amendment. You're allowed to go out and exercise. You're allowed to go out and walk through the park. You just have to abide by the rules. But they're calling this a gathering. So uh, we tried to bargain with them. We're getting a little panicky. We're scheduled to go live on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at 1 p.m. We've scheduled a live streaming feed for the press who we've urged not to show up. So it doesn't get too crowded. Uh, we do not have a crowd there. We don't want a crowd. Uh, and they are really trying to hustle us out of there before then. So we went on uh, live on these uh, platforms five or 10 minutes early. Uh, God knows how many people missed that. And we truncated the whole press conference to, down to about uh, 15 minutes when we had planned to go about half an hour. Several people who were scheduled to speak did not speak. And some, and some great people things with were, the signs went yeah. home, went home. They left the area. Right. Some great things were said. I mean, I, you know, Reverend Pat Bumgarner from the Metropolitan Community Church, she was asked about these nurses who proselytize patients. She said, anybody who does that when someone's on their deathbed to try to scare them from going to hell, he's, that's the most immoral thing I can think of. And an Episcopal deacon, uh, Jean Borquin, uh, came and talked about how Franklin Graham does not represent his religion. This is uh, just anathema to him. Uh, and a number uh, representative from well, Housing Works and, you know, uh, our people. You know, uh, look, uh, St. John the Divine, uh, the Episcopal Cathedral, they had Samaritan's Purse set up there but they never moved in and they were, they were not taken in. And, uh, but you know, well, the cathedral changed their mind. They had said it was okay to set up in there. And then they said, no, because people within uh, the St. John, the divine community uh, were objecting and saying, we, no, we don't want Franklin. The bishop doesn't admit that. But when Corey Johnson took this on and, and tried to stop it, Errol Lewis, who works, he's the anchor at New York one. He tweeted out about Corey, this is going, this is a bad move. People will die because of this. And I'm thinking, Errol Lewis, I don't remember you saying this when the hospital ship left town or when St. John the Divine said, no, we're not going to take them in. No, you went after the gays. And that's just awful. So uh, we managed to get 15 minutes on the air and to the press that were there. And that was good. Uh, people, I was so proud of everybody who spoke because they maintain their composure. Good. They did not let the cops are descending on us. In a, there are now about three or four dozen cops to maybe ten of us. Well, uh, they, they declared it an unlawful assembly under the governor's executive order, which was originally to stop parties and social gatherings and and those kinds of things. Uh, but now they're applying it to the First Amendment. Now, when Mayor de Blasio gets asked about this the next day, uh, he says, well, these people, they, you know, we're not going to tolerate people who don't respect life and public health. What an outrage for him disgusting. to say Disgusting. Disgusting to imply Absolutely that we don't disgusting. care about And he will not, de I mean, I, what, this was over on, this was way across town. I took pictures on the way home of people doing other things, like lining up for food, like lining up to get into Trader Joe's. They were close, more closely bunched, although they were spaced, uh, than this thing was. And yet this is the First Amendment and it's not allowed. So someone, only one person got a summons because we were, uh, you know, saying, All right, don't worry, we'll get out of here. 
So here's a picture of someone with a summit. <laughs> Recognize her? <laughs> now, I just want to assure you that I took the mask off just momentarily for the picture. Uh, uh, I had the mask on the rest of the time. And that summons, here's the interesting thing about that summons that they gave me. It has at least four major mistakes on it. They got my name wrong. They got the date wrong twice. They said it was February. And they got the county wrong where all this happened. So I'm trying to figure out whether the cops did that deliberately and singled me out deliberately because they do know me and like me. And they figured if they wrote the ticket this way, it would be thrown out of court or whether they're just being incompetent again, which is well, we want reclaim, reclaim Pride is going to fight this on behalf of all Americans. And I'm not exaggerating. Yes. You can shut down the First Amendment. You know, the mayor says, oh, just just find another way to get your message across. Why don't you find another way to get your message across? You're having press conferences. Why can't you know why can't and why, not wearing a mask? And, right. Uh, and the governor has press conferences. And, you know, some demonstrations have been allowed. There have been nurses that have been demonstrating because they don't have enough pr protective equipment, all kinds of things. This is selective enforcement. And again, we're not defending a mob that descends on City Hall or, the, or, the, or you know, whatever. We're, we're talking about people who are responsible. You and me, we don't want to get sick. Here we're in a tie uh, <laughs> and a jacket. But we really think, and I did get a chance to say this at the podium, between the time they took my ID and then actually handed me the summons, which took them about 20 minutes uh, to write it wrong, they wanted to censor our message. Our message, they were pissed off that we got Franklin Graham thrown out of town and embarrassed them by revealing what a monster he is. Yes. And, and we were there to say the governor is responsible, the mayor is responsible, Mount Sinai is responsible, and they have to fess up about how this happened and oh, how well Franklin, Franklin Graham uh, did an interview with it yesterday and said, oh, we got invited, we didn't ask to come. They asked us. And Mount Sinai's line, line has always been, uh, we didn't ask them, they volunteered. Uh, well, th actually, the, the line that they give is that they hired a guy to do emergency management at Mount Sinai over a year ago, <clears throat> and he's the one he knew about them because he'd worked in the Obama and Trump administrations in emergency stuff. He knew about them. He asked them. By the way, he had the job at Mount Sinai for over a year, and they didn't have enough protective equipment a year ago, and he never fixed that. And now we have this crisis. Well, my experience through these last few weeks has been that every time you ask the hospital, the mayor's office, the governor's office, all of which we've talked to all the way along, everybody has a different story and none of it implicates any of them. Well, so now Norman Siegel, the great uh, civil rights lawyer, is uh, trying to help and trying to he wrote a letter to the mayor. It was delivered by Natalie James and a mayor letter to the police commissioner saying we have a a picture of her doing that at police headquarters. This must not stand. She's with Reclaim Pride. And uh, I guess you, what do you, I mean, you're going to fight the ticket, obviously, but you're also trying to establish the principle. And I uh, think our, our elected officials need to step forward, have an outdoor press conference, show how it can be done. That's what Corey Johnson said. He said, we can, we, we should be able to do this if we physically distance, just like we do everything else. Well, good luck, Corey. That's what got me a summons. Right. Uh, then we can sue for selective enforcement. But Norman, who has represented us now for uh, a year and a half, reclaim pride first to be able to stage the queer liberation march last year. And then we were trying to do another one this year, but we've, we've been distracted and that's been canceled. Uh, but he wrote this letter to uh, the police commissioner, the mayor, and another one to the governor saying, you must rescind these executive orders, which are unconstitutional, and you must acknowledge, restore First Amendment rights, and you must withdraw the summons uh, issued to Ann Northrop. I I'm kind of enjoying the summons, but <laughs> <laughs> if they want to withdraw it, that's fine, or throw it out of court. It's a criminal charge, Ms. Northrop. I'm already a convicted criminal.
All right. Um, four counts. But uh, so that's and we will pursue that. And we will also pursue legally uh, getting these various entities to answer the question, how did this happen? I hope and I hope I hope uh, we've talked about this at length, but I hope you understand that this is part of a larger issue here. Now, before we go too far, I do want to acknowledge that May 1st was the 50th anniversary of the Lavender Menace action when uh, a, a bunch of radical lesbians, that was their name, uh, who, who wrote a woman identified uh, woman uh, manifesto, handed it out at the second Congress to unite women, which was held in Greenwich Village. So there they are. And this was a, a very radical action. Um, and they succeeded in seizing the Congress with a small band of lesbians, maybe 30 to 40, and it was an inspiration for groups that came after, Lesbian Avengers, Act Up. And our friend Carla J thinks it may have been the single most successful action undertaken by a lesbian group uh, ever. Show the second picture too. It was a zap. It was an action that interfered. Uh, uh, now on the far left is my old college friend, Lita, who is still a friend of mine. And next to her, to the right of her in the picture, is Rita Mae Brown. Yeah. Uh, and the, I'm sure we know the others. And just Ruby Fruit Jungle. Yes. <clears throat> and, you know, they, of course, one of the people they had to go, one of the most resistant people in the women's movement in those days was Betty Friedan. And she's the one who called them uh, Laven a lavender menace. And that's where the name came from. As you may or may not remember, I worked for her for about four days and found the experience so disheartening that I quit. Well, she got better later. I can remember her speaking when we were marching to extend the ERA uh, ratification time. And she gets up and she's up there in the, at the Capitol. This is not about homosexual marriage and you know unisex bathrooms. Oh, boy. But she, she mellowed in later life. If you could uh, believe it. I want to note another anniversary happening uh, today as we are taping and, and broadcasting on Facebook uh, Wednesday. Uh, it's Nurses Appreciation Day. And I don't want us to forget in all of this, Caius Kelly, one of the first health workers known to die in the epidemic, uh, nurse at Mount Sinai, who you were the one who met him and had a great experience with him. And he's Prior to this. an out gay man. And I just, every time I think about him, I think, you know, Franklin Graham would never have hired this guy. And he gave his life for this city. You're going to make me cry because I'd only met him a few weeks before this all got started. And I was cleaning up and I found his card that he had given me. And it just, you know, I mean, what a one. And so many people came up to me after I wrote the story and said, I had that experience with him. He did this for my husband or whatever, blah, 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 went on and on and on. He was, I mean, you know, I don't, I'm not a religious person. He was like an angel. Well, I think nurses are. Yes, and I think they are far too undersung, uh, heroic force uh, every day. And so I do appreciate nurses today. And and particularly Caius Kelly. Well, then should we talk about some of the other people we've lost at this at this? Point? Well, wait a second. I just want to make sure. I have a lot of other news. But yes, as we, we do. do. But oh, well, do you want to talk about uh, the city and others needing to collect data first? Oh, yeah, I do want to get to that. We can we can do that now if you. I mean, yeah. I have to look well, we're still talking about the epidemic, so yeah. Yeah. So should we, should we talk about who we lost? I was going to say go to the data first and then go to. Uh... Well, simply that, you know, New York City has a law that says they've got to collect data on uh, who um, uh, is, is gay, or lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, whatever. Uh, this was a law that was passed four years ago. And I cannot get any statistics on COVID-19 and LGBT people and people with HIV, I can't get it out of the administration. The mayor did answer my question about it at a press conference. Oh, that's very important. The uh, the uh, health commissioner, Barbeau, oh, well, you know, uh, we want to be completely transparent. They're not, they won't respond. They well, won't because respond. they're not, they're not collecting it, let alone releasing not it. Collect well, the thing is, everybody who's admitted to a hospital is asked if they have HIV. And we especially want to know about this because how are they doing? You know, there is a- Anecdotally, better. 
right that the, because they take these HIV drugs that they are doing better. Um, Dr. Urbina from Mount Sinai, you know, uh, says the use of anti HIV antivirals might have a possibly mitigating effect on, on it. And uh, there's, there's an NIH proposal to study the natural course of COVID in persons living with HIV, but we could be doing that right now. Some of this is coming from our associate producer, Bill Ballman. And in California, an out gay uh, member of the legislature, uh, Scott Weiner, has introduced a bill to uh, force the state to be releasing uh, information like that. By uh, the way, the, uh, the, the Affordable Care Act was supposed to uh, mandate in 2011 under mm -hmm. Sebelius this collection of this data. Didn't happen. Uh, the Daily Show did a, a segment on gay men unable to do donate plasma, including Lucas Estock. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what do I have here? Oh, um, our friend Andy Taines, uh, who's a viewer, uh, asked on a Zoom call about COVID and HIV, about donating plasma. And one doctor said, oh, we're taking it, but just for study, not for helping people. Uh, and uh, last note on the drugs, the FDA did give Gilead uh, emergency approval for use of remdesivir in, uh, with people with the uh, virus yep. because of the study we talked about last week that showed some uh, help. Uh, but TAG, the Treatment Action Group, put out a, a press release saying that there's not enough detailed information on the trials of remdesivir to be announcing it as the standard of care. Uh, uh, Gilead will donate one and a half million vials for 140,000 people, but <laughs> it turns out it costs them $10 to produce a 10 day course of the drug and they're expected to charge for it. This is a guess, $4,500. I mean, talk about the need to uh, invoke the Defense Act in order to get this out to people. And I mean that, but that would that would require a sane human being as president. Uh, by the way, in Hollywood, Florida, there are two doctors who are married to each other, uh, John Whitehead and Alan Ramirez, both diagnosed with COVID in March, had a very rough ride, but they recovered, and they're unable to donate uh, plasma. Uh, they're back to work but it's unknown if they can be reinfected. That's the other thing here. Or just rebound with the infection they have. I see that HRC has laid off 22 employees due to COVID. Yeah. And uh, well, okay. All right, so let's, uh, uh, let's move on to those we've lost. To the people we've lost. Well, I knew David Carter very well. Uh, you, you all probably know him as the author of the definitive book on the Stonewall Rebellion, Stonewall, the riots that sparked the gay revolution, a meticulous historian. He was really able to separate myth from fact, if we can get David's picture up there. This book became the basis of the PBS American Experience documentary, Stonewall Uprising, which won a Peabody Award. Uh, and... He also wrote biographies of Salvador Dali, George Santayana. He edited Spontaneous Mind, which were interviews with Allen Ginsberg. And he was also an activist as well as a writer, you know? And he was, and, and when he died, we think of a heart condition. He was working on a biography of Frank Kameny. He worked closely with the National Park Service to have the site of the rebellion made into a national monument. And when we talk about that site, we mean the streets around the Stonewall Inn. Uh, we also lost a very well-known New York figure, uh, Richard Hake, who was a radio host on uh, the local WNYC and on NPR, uh, Morning Edition and other shows. Uh, out gay man, hosted the annual WNYC Pride event, uh, was quite an expert on uh, Streisand and Fire Island and and just a beloved guy here in New York. Very He's the silly. guy who woke you up in the morning. He was known as fearless in front of a live yeah, mic, got multiple much. awards. He covered, he covered the plight of homeless LGBT youth okay. on the piers in New York. Uh, well, yeah, I... Uh, Rich, we're I hearing you. I got knocked offline. Rich, we're hearing uh, you. We're hearing you, Rich. Oh, sorry. Okay. 
There's our director, Rich Speziali, who uh, you don't I always apologize for me. That's all right. Very rich. Is there... Okay, we're back. Uh, and then we lost in Gainesville, Florida, a local activist there, Terry Fleming, 58 years old, uh, activist, organizer, co-founder of the Pride Center there. Uh, he was also an activist for the homeless uh, and and uh, for the Democratic Party. And there are a lot of things online about how important he was to the Gainesville community and what a huge loss this is. So. Passed laws against conversion therapy and a, uh, that, that community center served 13 counties. Wow. All right. Uh, not gay was Dr. Richard Friedman, but is, that's this, he was 79 years old. He's a psychoanalyst responsible for debunking the myth that homosexuality can be cured. You know, the psychoanalysts were terribly late on this. The American Psychiatric Association got rid of the illness thing in 1973. Uh, I believe the uh, psychoanalyst didn't do it until about 91 or two, uh, but he wrote Male Homosexuality, a Contemporary Psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic Perspective. Um, and he, he thought sexual orientation was largely biological. His wife said, straight people had the same personality issues and they got away with murder. But gay people were stigmatized, and he didn't think that was right. <laughs> he challenged the Freudians. Uh, he died on March 31st. He had multiple health problems. Uh, yeah, sounds like a great guy. And then uh, we just heard of another murder of a black trans woman in Sykestown, Missouri. Nina Pop, 28 years old, found at home multiple stab wounds, uh, not any more details than that, I think, yet, but uh, this is what, the 10th or 11th uh, yes. trans woman? town is a little, little town of, well, it's a town of 16,000 people, 145 miles from St. Louis. Uh, they don't, they don't, they, they're going to investigate it as a hate crime, but they don't know the motive. No. And by the way, in Puerto Rico, there have been two arrests and the murders of the New York City trans women who were down there who got killed. Serena Angelique Velasquez, 32 of Queens, and Leila Palaez, 21 of the Bronx. They were killed April 22nd. Arrested were two men, 19 and 21. One confessed. Uh, they planned the murders. They took them to a lovely spot. And after discovering that they were transgender, burned them alive. Uh, they were, uh, so the police realized they were with these women. The FBI, by the way, assisted in this because it is covered under the hate crimes statute, uh, transgender, yes? Uh, yes. Now, uh, one uh, population we don't hear enough about in the pandemic is uh, migrants, immigrants, right. people all over the world. Uh, migrants are being thrown out of countries and set uh, a sea with no place to go all sorts of horrible things going on. Well, the uh, trans population coming across the southern border of the U.S. is in particular trouble and being held in terrible conditions in ICE uh, detention facilities. The Transgender Law Center and other uh, legal organizations have just filed a class action suit on their behalf asking that trans immigrants be released from ICE custody. Uh, there's... Okay lot of attempt to do that, but they're not uh, getting very far. In Ohio, at a Catholic school, they fired a beloved teacher for getting married four years ago. They finally found out about it at Archbishop Alter High School in Kettering. James Zimmerman taught English for 23 years, a favorite teacher, and he's been sacrificed on the altar of prejudice. Well, as long as we're discussing religion, the United Methodist Church canceled its general conference that was supposed to take place this month. Yep. They were going to hold uh, big votes on splitting the denomination and on marriage and uh, uh, ordaining LGBT pastors. All of that is postponed till next year at least or whenever they can get together. And I do a couple of Trump notes. Uh, there's a digital right. rally that's taking place today against the nomination of Justin Walker. That's Mitch McConnell's 38-year-old protege. Oh, He's already on the federal court. They want to put him on the D.C. circuit who's, with no experience. 
uh, Senate Republicans are, uh, are risking the health of their colleagues and the staff to bull this nomination through. Uh, a, okay. By the way, there, um, let's see, the Supreme Court's going to hear three cases on whether Trump is above the law. Oh, and the human rights campaign, drum roll, please. Are you ready for this announcement? They've endorsed <laughs> Joe Biden for president on the eighth anniversary of him coming out for same-sex marriage on Meet the Press. Well, just as shocking, Joe Biden has uh, uh, hired uh, former ambassador, uh, out gay uh, Obama ambassador to Denmark, Rufus Gifford. He's now the deputy campaign manager for uh, Biden. I have to say that, you know, Biden's made another. Hold it. There he is on the, on the screen. That's him in, in the, the middle, middle with the Obamas and his husband. And he was very popular in Denmark as a representative of the U.S. and, uh, you know, sort of a man about town and uh, wealthy as ambassadors often are. I, as far as I know, he's a good guy and has accomplished a lot. But as Biden announces his advisors or hires people, it's the self-perpetuating hierarchy. It's, you, <laughs> it's the same old people. It, it, it never fails. You know, I, I can remember working for David Dinkins with a lot of activists when he became mayor. And then all of a sudden I saw the permanent government move in and mostly take over. Yeah. All right. And, uh, uh, I don't know whether we need to mention uh, Justin Amash, the uh, former Republican turned independent who's announced he's running for president. I certainly don't think as a libertarian he's going to get a lot of votes, but he could screw around in Michigan where he's from. Well, I will say uh, Noam Chomsky said, if you decide to vote for the destruction of organized human life on Earth, then do it openly. But that's the meaning of never Biden. Yeah. Uh, but I have to say my most uh, confounding and yet favorite moment of the week was yesterday on Tuesday, as we're taping on Wednesday, when Trump went to Arizona to the Honeywell plant where they're making face masks and the loudspeaker was playing live and let die. <laughs> the old James Bond theme sung by Guns N' Roses. Who managed to get live and let die was played it in a mask? I, it, it's loudly. It's, it's not just us. no. It's, it's it's all the stuff they're talking about now. About we have to put the country back to work and let people die. Yes, people are going to die. Trump says it. Chris Christie says it. They're all saying it. And uh, the fact that they can come out and say that. Uh, well, uh, the idea that anybody would vote for them. They're not letting democracy die in New York. Uh, there was a challenge by Andrew Yang to Governor Cuomo, who canceled the New York primary on June 23rd, the presidential primary. Now, yeah, you know, looks like Biden's going to win, but we're electing delegates and there are a lot of other elections. The, you know, the governor, you know, wanted to cancel as much as he could. So he's been thwarted. Uh, a, a federal judge ruled uh, that uh, democracy is one. And again, if you live in New York, everybody can vote by absentee ballot. You're going to get an application asking you to ask for an absentee ballot. Uh, in Colorado, yet again, a Christian so-called web design company has filed suit preemptively. No gay people have come to them asking for their help. But they've gone to court to say, we want to go to court and make sure that we don't have to work with any gay people uh, if they should be stupid enough to come ask us to uh, to hire us for our services. Now here's a story from Brooklyn that may surprise you. We have a picture of Derek Gaskell, a trans man, one of six trans people who are suing the Democratic Party. They're all trans, non-binary or gender non-conforming, and they tried to run for the county committee. I used to be on the county committee. It's a very low level, you know, but it's the governing body of the party. Uh, they were disqualified because they left the gender field blank on their application. Um, you have to pick M or F, male or female. The party requires you to be that. And because uh, the, they have but, quotas, they have but, quotas. But for and the board of elections tried to assign them false genders. <laughs> so they're suing. <laughs> Well, I have finally got a good news story of the week, and this one really touched my heart. And that is from Belfast, Maine, oh, where 18-year-old yes. Sid Sanders, a young trans man, 
uh, has been elected valedictorian of his high school class. He, by the way, is headed for Harvard. Uh, he is uh, he has the most amazing story. He grew up on Islesboro, Maine, an island off the coast of Maine. Very, very conservative uh, island. And he was so picked on and unhappy there that he asked his mother to transfer him, I guess. He ended up at Belfast Area High School. And he was still kind of depressed and unhappy. And then a, a close friend of his was killed in a bike accident. And he took a look at her and what her life had been and what he thought of her. And he said, you know what? I cannot be miserable anymore. And he plunged into volunteer work and his classroom work and, and everything else and became such a star in the high school, president of his class, junior and senior years. And he made himself happy. And now he's going on to Harvard. He's got brilliant grades. And it's just such a feel-good story. And we're going to link to the local paper's uh, uh, piece about him in our weekly show note. Uh, go to gayusatv.org to sign up to get our weekly show note. It's a really heartwarming story. And I will link to all my, my two articles this week about the press conference and about Samaritan's Purse and all that stuff. By the way, uh, this uh, Sid Sanders said, I just am who I am. That sounds like a great idea for a song. His dad, by the way, is the mayor. Yeah, great. Uh, a couple of, now uh, uh, in uh, D.C., oh. a couple of uh, gay bars are closing because of the oh, yeah. virus. Uh, the D.C. Eagle and Zigfield Secrets, they've been around for 40 and 50 years. Oh. That's sad. Uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, an appeals court threw out their local non-discrimination law because the city council had passed it as a theory, you know, we're going to uh, write a non-discrimination law, but they never got around to it. So the court says it's unenforceable. And how about that Robin Vaughn, uh, the woman in Trenton, the city council? Oh, please. I, you don't you want know. to talk about it? Well, feel free. We don't have well, a lot I mean, of time. She's, she's, she was on a conference call with the gay mayor and she went on an anti-LGBT rant, not just with him calling him a pedophile and all these kinds of things, but pr said one of the other council members wanted to, was performing oral sex on him. This is the kind of stuff people are calling for her resignation. Well, she does this all the time. She's totally out of control. Garden it, State Equality wants her to resign. Well, I do too. In uh, Byron, Georgia, uh, the uh, trans fire chief, Rachel Mosby, is suing. She was fired. She says it's because she came out as trans. The city claims uh, poor performance on her part, but she'd been working there for a long, long time without any objections. So we'll see what happens there. And congratulations to Andy for having a baby. Yes, Anderson Cooper, and they've named the baby Wyatt. It was born through surrogacy. Wyatt, I believe, was the name of his brother and his father? Yes. Yes. Yes, his father was uh, Wyatt Cooper. Uh, and and Anderson is 52 years old, had this son through surrogacy, and is over the moon about it. Yes. Uh, so congratulations to him. And now his child and Andy Cohen's child can grow up together All and right. be best friends. Okay. Uh, I also just wanted to remember that this week was the 50th anniversary of the massacre at Kent State uh, of four students. Very formative event uh, in my life as a senior in college at the time. Colleges across the country went on strike. But there you had the National Guard going in there and just live ammunition shooting down students who were protesting the Vietnam War. It was... We're dead in Ohio. Yeah. Uh, we think this is a terrible time, and it certainly is, but we've had a lot of terrible times in this country, so... And uh, when, are we going to international news? Yes. The former Pope Benedict is making it worse. He called same-sex marriage a product of the Antichrist. He said society has become so hostile to Christian doctrine that it will shun any, that's, uh, the, that's Pope Benedict with his boyfriend, Georg Ganswein, and I mean boyfriend. 
you know, uh, he said, uh, you'll get shunned if you oppose equal marriage rights now. But that's his experience of society because it's limited to the gay clique in the Vatican now. He also condemned abortion and assisted reproduction. I guess he d- intends to die an unreconstructed closeted bigot. Uh, th- these are not new attitudes for him. Uh, I thought he was had been silenced when Francis took over, but evidently not. Oh, this well, all you, comes this comes from a new book written by a German right. author. Well, what did you think about that other story coming out of Italy? That there's this town in Italy, uh, Torvejanaka. Or I'm getting it wrong. <laughs> where a priest turned the parish into a haven for trans women. Supposed, off mostly from Latin America, mostly sex workers, supposedly with the backing of of uh, the current pope. It's a, uh, I, I read it, you know, on a, a credible site. Uh, the pope apparently sent them some money. I don't, I'm just, we Who were, knows? Well, in uh, hopscotching through the uh, international news in Uganda, nineteen gay men who'd been arrested for gathering in public have been denied bail, so they're still in. Uh, in jail. In Taiwan, more than 3,500 same-sex couples have been married since the law took effect back in May, May 24th of last year. Ooh, uh, 1,122 male couples, 2,431 female, but there have also been 188 divorces of same-sex couples already. In, in under a year. Uh, in Turkey, uh, the prosecutor in Ankara is investigating the Ankara Bar Association for insulting the religious values adopted by a part of the public. The Bar Association and the Human Rights Group uh, objected when the local uh, Muslim leader to kick off Ramadan uh, said nasty things about gay people. The president of Turkey, Erdogan, supported him uh, they spoke out and now they're being investigated by the prosecutor for some ridiculous law that says you can't insult the public. <laughs> and in the country of Georgia, uh, in, uh, how do you say this, Tbilisi? Yes. Okay. A trans woman set herself on fire to protest the, the stay-at-home order and to highlight government indifference to transgender people, many of whom are sex workers, many of whom can't, can't work anymore and can't pay the rent. The police grabbed her burning jacket, which was on fire, and then arrested her. Uh, Georgia requires bottom surgery to change your gender marker there. They don't cover the surgery under their health plans. So she was desperate. In Kenya, uh, you may remember a few years ago, we talked a lot about a a lesbian movie, wonderful movie called Rafiki. It was a big hit at Cannes, uh, but it was banned in Kenya. It's available on Amazon Prime. I highly recommend it for your, uh, you know, isolation viewing Rafiki. Well, the producers went to court in Kenya uh, in the last week or two to ask that the ban be lifted. This is now several years ago. And the court said, absolutely not. This promotes homosexuality. The ban stays. But didn't it get a uh, Academy Award nomination for Best Foreign Film? It was expected to. I'm not sure it ended Uh, up getting it. It should have won because it's so good. Uh, Really, if you have not seen Rafiki, see Rafiki. Entertainment news? Uh, No, I got a couple other things here. Right ahead. Uh, In Canada, uh, the Queer Yukon and All Genders Yukon Society has hired an executive director who will build a pride center in the Yukon. I think that's pretty great. Uh, In Hungary, they've changed the rules uh, about men who have sex with men donating blood. They've loosened it up and said, yes, they can donate. No window of exclusion. Hungary. Hungary. But if you have engaged in risky behavior, uh, then you may be uh, rejected. But that applies across the board as it should. That should be the standard for everybody. And this is what they're doing. They're cracked down on LGBT people. uh, Of course. And in uh, the UK, a court refused to register a trans man uh, who gave birth Trans men can uh, reproduce if they go off their uh, testosterone for a while. Their female hormones uh, are 
operative and they can become pregnant. We've covered pregnant uh, trans men over the years. So this guy gave birth and he wanted to be listed as father or parent on the birth certificate. And the court said, no, you must be listed as the mother. So Freddie McConnell, pictured here, will uh, be listed as the mother, but is appealing that court decision. He was at the Tribeca Film Festival because he was the subject of a documentary called Seahorse, uh, you know, because he, you know, he stopped hormones so he could have a baby. Um, his attorneys want the law to keep pace with the reality that his son will know that Freddie is his father. Yeah, exactly. All right. We've discussed those issues a lot. All right, entertainment news. Well, you mentioned Bad Education, the uh, HBO movie uh, yep. about a, a scandal at a, a stealing from schools by a superintendent out on Long Island, played by you, Jackman. I thought it was terrific, but the guy, the real guy it's based on, the school superintendent, Frank Tassone, who has paid his debts to society after he stole millions, uncovered by a student journalist, which I was so impressed by. Yep. Uh, he says his gay life was not that sordid, He's still with his longtime partner for 45 years. We had an open relationship. I did not go out with a former student, as they put in there. And I got out for good behavior. So it was sensationalized. Well, you know, when you're when you're close to these stories and you see them distorted like that, you get very upset. But for those of us not involved in the story, it's a good movie. It was edgy. It was pretty edgy. Yeah. Uh, HBO has a new series, a couple of new series. Uh, one, We're Here, which is three oh, yeah. RuPaul drag stars going around the country to very tiny towns and uh, dealing with people's relationships. Uh, they've done an episode in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and an episode in Twin Falls, Idaho. And the next episode is in Branson, Missouri. I, I'm watching this. I find it quite uh, compelling. And they've also got a new half hour series called Betty that is a more fictional, but based on real life about girl skateboarders in, I think in LA. And uh, that has a lot of uh, lesbian themes to it. Let's talk about our gay Pulitzer Prize winners. Okay. Uh, for drama, uh, the, the musical, A Strange Loop, and Michael R. Jackson is his name. This was a real big hit off Broadway. It's about a black gay writer working a day job he hates while writing an original musical about a black gay writer working a day job he hates while writing an original musical. It's very meta. I This is one of the few things I missed last year that I really regret yeah, me missing. Too. Me too, me too. I, um, I hope they bring it back uh, if uh, we ever get theater again. Jericho uh, Brown, do we have his picture now next? Uh, not the, yeah, there he is. He won for poetry. Uh, called The Tradition. The committee said that his poem questions why and how we become accustomed to terror from mass shootings to rape to the murder of unarmed people by the police. So heavy stuff, but he apparently does it very, very well. Got a Pulitzer. And a, a second black gay man winning a Pulitzer this year. Right. Amazing. And then there's uh, Benjamin Moser. He won for biography for his biography of Sontag, Susan Sontag, her life and work. Uh, it's been called a definitive portrait of her writing activism and hidden private face because he had access to her, her restricted archives and access to Annie Leibovitz. <laughs> her uh, Susan Sontag, uh, by the way. Uh, and another Pulitzer winner in the news, uh, out gay man, Mark Schuf's. Uh, who won a Pulitzer for his AIDS coverage years yes. ago? Wall Street the Village, uh, okay. Well, Village Voice, I think he won for the Village Voice, and then he got hired by the Wall Street Journal. And he worked at BuzzFeed, and then he's been teaching at USC at the Annenberg School of Journalism and Communication. Well, now he's just been named the new editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed, living wow. in L.A. Uh, so congratulations to Mark Shoup. He is a wonderful journalist, wonderful BuzzFeed, which used to be run by the son of the judge who did a sin on same-sex marriage in New York. Ben Smith. Yes. All uh, right. One other thing to recommend on Netflix, uh, not that I've seen it, but we talked years ago about the movie Saving Face, a lesbian movie by a first-time Asian-American woman filmmaker, Alice Wu. And she has now made a movie called The Half of It, 
uh, again, queer themes and now running on Netflix. Uh, great reviews. So check out the half of it on Netflix. So Chris Cooper, our, uh, a, our sacrificial moviegoer and sometimes co-host, he's come out of retirement here to uh, make some recommendations of some older films that you might want to check out. One of them is Winter's Bone. He calls it a lean, intense mystery drama about a poor family navigating the devastation of meth in rural Missouri that put Jennifer Lawrence on the map. And I've seen me. that. Haven't you seen that? He said it's the best movie you've never seen. Well, I've, I've seen, seen it. Uh, it's an old movie or from a few years ago. It is a good movie. I agree with Chris on um, Winter's Bone. Now, Chris recommends, uh, and we're going to disagree, the kids are all right uh, with Julianne Moore and Mark Ruffalo. I, I had looked forward to that, you know, but then they, you know, they were, I don't want to spoil it for everybody, but they do they have to make lesbians go with a man, uh, you know. Uh, Not to mention with, throwing in a little alcoholism. It deals with the, and Julianne Moore. It deals with their teenage children who want to meet the sperm donor, blah, 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 blah. So Very Chris recommends it, we don't. Uh, we do uh, not. Then he also recommends Team America World Police. He says there are no words for this, at least not fit for TV. Remember those kitty shows in Super Marionation. Ah, marry it to the insane transgression of Trey Parker and Matt Stone, the duo behind South Park and the Book of Mormon, and prepare to laugh your tail off. I'm substituting a word there. Uh, <laughs> warning, the puppet sex scene will leave your eyeballs permanently scarred. <laughs> I, I don't feel I will be making room for that in my schedule, but who knows? Well, I mean, I don't understand why we're not collapsed at this point. I mean, you've been working so hard this week and out there and uh, it's just... I, I have two Zoom call meetings after this and something I cannot, tomorrow. I cannot keep up with you. But well, I, you, I did not expect to be busier than I've ever been in isolation. Uh, <laughs> I thought this was supposed to be a great rest period for right. people. I'm still You're waiting. Some of those books behind me, maybe, you know? But well, I've got, I've got a pile of magazines and stuff uh, that I haven't gotten to. I'm you hoping to get to the Times today. You're in it. Uh, but not in the hard copy, only online. But oh, if you okay. go, if you have access to the New York Times online, you can read all about the uh, busted up press. Conference. I'm going to send you my articles on it. If you sign up for our email list, I think Andy, Andy has been doing amazing, comprehensive uh, articles on this whole dispute. So comprehensive that when I sent it to one friend, she wrote back, uh, congratulations, TLDR. What does that mean? Too long. Didn't read. <laughs> I had to Google it. When people write these uh, abbreviations, you could now Google them and they'll explain them to you. Well, the spokesperson from Mount Sinai wanted it to be shorter. He said, I told you that off the record. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, that's that's bad. It's just a mistake. It was a mistake. I said, we'll take it out. I, I, I'll, you know. Well, one of the heartwarming things that has happened in the last few weeks for me is we got a lot of leaked information from people inside. Mount seconds. Sinai. Uh, so thank you for all the information, all of you. Five seconds. You, viewers. Goodbye. Bye. See you. Thank you for being here. <laughs>